What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and today I'm joined by Dr. Bart Ehrman. Uh, uh, Bart, do you uh, kind of want to tell people like who you are and uh, what you do and all that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm a professor of uh, religious studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, I've taught here since 1988, and uh, I have a PhD in New Testament studies from Princeton Theological Seminary. Most of my research is on uh, Christianity, basically from Jesus to Constantine, so the first 300 years of, of Christianity. Oh, cool. And I just want to start off the stream by saying, I feel like I have nearly every single one of your books. <laughs> And uh, I, uh, I, I have to say, I, I feel like most of them are, are very excellent, and I, I suggest uh, them to everybody. Um, and I use them regularly in my content, uh, you know, on on my channel. Um, and so, um, the reason why we're here today is because you have a conference that's coming up. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to tell people about that? You know, uh, what it's about and how they can get uh, more information on it. Yeah, so doing this conference on uh, September 23rd and 24th, and um, it's a remote conference, so anybody can um, can can uh, get a get a ticket and come without having to go anywhere. I'm having ten of the top gospel scholars uh, in the country. I guess you could say actually in the world, ten of the top uh, scholars of the New Testament Gospels each presenting a paper, a 50-minute uh, talk about uh, some aspect of the Gospels. These talks are to be uh, are going to be uh, directed toward non-scholars, so they're not going to be presupposing a lot of knowledge. And these are these are really interesting papers by people who are absolutely experts uh, uh, in 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 the world. And uh, there'll be a Q and A after each one. And so it'll be a two-day conference. Um, it's called New Insights into the New Testament. And uh, it's people like Amy Jill Levine and Canada Moss. And we have archaeologists like Jody Magnus and James Tabor. So a whole, a whole range of, of people who are top flight. And so if people are interested, they can, uh, just to see what it's like and what it's all about, they can go to www.barterman.com and just, uh, just click on uh, online courses. And then they'll see the the course called New New Insights into the New Testament. Yeah, and uh, well, I'll definitely have a link down in the description if you want to go and check that out, and if you want to get tickets to it. Um, you know, I I got tickets to your debate with Mike Lacona, um, and I think that's I don't I don't think I don't know if that's the last thing that you did, like as far as like online stuff. Um, but I, I I highly suggest all of your online courses and, and lectures and seminars and everything like that, because they, they are good. Um, and, and so I, I definitely suggest people, uh, you know, watch those. <laughs> uh, the Michael Icona debate was really interesting. We, uh, both me and my wife watched the entire day because it was like an eight hour debate. It was a long and debate. It was just, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It, was, it was really great. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm glad you liked it. it was, yeah. It was, pretty wiped out after that one. But I have a number of courses on a number of topics that people might be interested in if they look at the side. And that lacuna, the one was definitely, definitely one of the highlights. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, part of this uh, conference that you get going on is kind of discussing some interpolations that have occurred in the Bible. I know uh, there's one talk, I can't remember who's, who's talking about it right now. Um, uh, but uh, there's one talk over, you know, the uh, woman caught in adultery and how that's uh, kind of been inserted later. And I was, uh, they got me thinking, like, what's the criteria for determining, like, what's an interpolation, like, in the Bible? Like, is there is there a set of criteria or is there, like, oh, a yeah. pretty solid methodology for determining those? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, very solid. It's been the kind of thing that's been studied uh, really since the invention of printing in the early 16th century with some very, very serious scholars dealing with this problem. Most scholars probably would differentiate between the, the, the term interpolation and the term textual change or textual alteration. Um, a textual alteration is when a scribe is copying a manuscript. So all of these, all of these manuscripts are hundreds of years until printing were were copied by hand, and sometimes scribes would make mistakes. In fact, a lot of times they they like accidentally, you know, mess up, leave out a word or something, or change a word accidentally. Uh, and sometimes they would intentionally change things. So, though, but if they if they're copying a text, and we have manuscripts that show the changes, then those are textual alterations. Uh, 
technically speaking, an interpolation would be a textual change for which we have no manuscripts. In other words, like some, there are some places in the New Testament where scholars think, you know, Paul didn't really write that, but it's in all the manuscripts. See what I mean? That would be an interpolation. And for that, boy, there's got to be really, there's got to be pretty rigorous evidence for that. This, the passage you're talking about, Jesus and the woman taken in an adult, in adult Jesus and the woman taken in adultery, occurs in uh, John chapters 9 and uh, 7 and 8, John chapter 7 and 8. And it, there's plenty of textual evidence for that. And so, in other words, there are manuscripts that have it and manuscripts that don't have it. And so scholars have to decide, uh, well, is it is it something that was um, was originally in John or not? And um, you know, mo a lot of us who study this kind of thing don't really care one way or the other. We just want to know, you know, what, which was it in there or not? And so there's a whole range of criteria uh, that scholars go through in order to make that kind of decision. Uh, and that's actually going to be the topic of my my talk actually at this conference is I'm taking a different textual variant, but I'll be talking about how scholars decide, you know, what kind, how do they decide, you know, in terms of like which manuscripts have it? Uh, what about the oldest manuscripts? What about the most numbers of manuscripts? What about the best quality manuscripts? But they also look at things like, um, is the, is this story, is it consistent with the writing style of the rest of this book? Is there vocabulary that's being used here that's never used anywhere else in the book? Are there grammatical constructions that this author just doesn't use? Are there themes that are found here that are, are contrary to the author's uh, views elsewhere? And once you do all that, for a story of this magnitude, it's pretty easy to come to a conclusion. This was not originally there, even though people know about it because it's in the King James Bible. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, that's, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I love reading about... Thank you. Uh, I love I love reading about um, this topic, and uh, uh, I mean that that you know <laughs> seems pretty much uh, what I've read about uh, about it. But I'm I'm glad that you're going to be doing um, a portion uh, of it uh, on that particular uh, uh, sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other like well known interpolations? Like I know that the ending of Mark is is tacked on, like that's added on. But I just uh, I didn't know if there were any other like well-known um, things that have been added to the Gospels? Well, there are a lot of things, really. The Gospel, yeah, if you're just sticking with the Gospels, yeah, there, there are lots of them that scholars know about um, have, and have known about uh, for a very long time. The, the passage I'm going to be talking about is one that most scholars don't even know about. <laughs> but it's, it's a passage where in Mark's Gospel, um, Jesus is being crucified, and he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in uh, one Greek manuscript and a number of Latin manuscripts, Jesus says something else. He says, my God, my God, why have you reviled me or reproached me or mocked me? And, um, whoa, <laughs> God's mocking Jesus. Uh, wh what is that all about? Could it actually be what Mark originally wrote? Uh, that's, it's a very interesting question. And it's the kind of thing that textual scholars like me try to, try to, to decide. Okay. What uh, I'm kind of curious, what does, uh, cause I know that that particular portion, um, is kind of echoing, uh, from one of the Psalms. Is that, isn't that correct? Um, yeah, the, like, the, the statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me is a, um, quotation from Psalm 22. And, um, in Mark, it's actually quoted first in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. Uh, and so, um, Mark does this on a few occasions. He'll use an Aramaic word or phrase and then give a translation of it. So it's a quotation of Psalm 22. Okay. Awesome. Um, and, you know, uh, the, thinking about interpolations and what's been added to the Gospels as well as other texts in the New Testament uh, kind, kind of sent my ADHD brain down a path of like, well, how do we determine you know, uh, historical facts that might be in mm -hmm. the Gospels. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you brought up the crucifixion. And I know that, uh, that I've heard you talk on this before. And this is, this is kind of one of the points that I've, I've, I've sort of disagreed with you on is um, the crucifixion being like um, one, of, one of the, uh, I guess, what most well attested uh, facts about Jesus that we can like, that we can state. It, it, is that, is that your position or am I misremembering that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think it's the position of just about every 
expert on the New Testament, is that the crucifixion of Jesus is, you know, if you've got to pick something about Jesus, there are a few things you can pick that are, you know, as likely, you know, that he was a Jewish teacher. He came from Galilee. He had followers. Um, and that, um, so there are, there are, you know, there's a list of things that virtually everybody agrees with, but the crucifixion is right. It's right there at the top, or maybe is at the, is the top. Okay. I'm just kind of curious, um, uh, about how, how you, you know, justify that as being like one of the most solid facts, like what, mm-hmm. what, what, what kind of things kind of lean you in that direction? Well, you know, if you really want to get to the heart of it, you have to ask how do historians know that anything happened? You know, I mean, how do how do we know um, that um, you know that Obama was the elected president at one point? How do we know that Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address? How do we know that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon? I mean, these are all we can't. You know, we don't have um, we don't have videotapes of Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. So why should we think so? And um, that's the kind of thing that historians always do. I mean, by their very nature, historians tend to be skeptical. Um, because you, you just don't, you know, if you find a source that says something, <laughs> all you know is that the source says it. <laughs> and so you have to figure out, is the source right? <laughs> and that's what historians do. They take the sources and they try to figure out if they're right. And, the, you know, bib- so biblical scholars do the same thing as scholars of the Civil War do or the scholars of ancient Rome do or scholars of the, of the Middle Ages do. They look, at, they look at the kinds of sources that we have. They try to figure out if there are events that are mentioned in the sources that are plausible to begin with. You know, is there something like so crazily implausible about this that it couldn't have happened? Um, they, they look to see if you've got multiple sources rather than just one source. You know, if you've got one source, well, okay, but I mean, you know, maybe the person made it up. So if you've got multiple sources and these multiple sources all say the same thing and they didn't rely on each other, you know, well, that's better than if you got one source um, that says something. I mean, if the one source says it, it might be right. But, you know, you, if you got multiple sources saying it, it's more likely. Um, you look to see if a, uh, if a if an event that is talked about or a saying that somebody allegedly said um, was um, – was something that that the that the earliest sources would have wanted to promote in order to support their own biases about the situation, um, or is it contrary uh, to what they would have preferred to say? And if it and if you've got things that are contrary to what they would have preferred to say, well, that's more likely authentic because they they would have been making it up. See what I mean? I mean if they if you've got if you got a woman on a witness stand in a court of law and her, her son is being accused of you know, murder and she and he's given this alibi that involves his mother and his mother says, yeah, no, actually, he, that's not true. <laughs> if his mother says that, you say, oh, my God, <laughs> so much for his alibi because she's saying something contrary to what she would have wanted to say. You see what I mean? And so scholars... Scholars use that. People look at they look at the historical context, whether uh, a claim about what somebody said or did actually can plausibly be set situated in the historical context. So there's a whole there's a whole list of things that historians use to figure out what happened in Germany in 1939 and what happened in in America in 16 whatever <laughs> before there was in America. I mean, what you just so you. Um, yeah, so that's what historians do, and they do that with the Gospels. That's what Gospel historians do. When you apply those kind of criteria, it's really um, – mo- most scholars – it sounds like you wouldn't agree with them, but most scholars would say it's a no-brainer about the crucifixion, that, that it's, it's rock solid, as, as much as can be, as much as mm-hmm. you know, something 2,000 years ago can be. Well, and uh, I mean, I do think that it's certainly, um, you know, possible uh, about uh, Jesus being crucified. I just, um, I, I guess I just have a, a, a little bit of trouble really substantiating, like stating it as a fact and, um, and, and not just uh, like a, a fabrication by the gospel authors, because, it, and this is, I guess, my perspective on it, the, the gospel authors are known for you know, mining the Old Testament scriptures um, for information about the Messiah. Uh, you've got Matthew that directly states that. You've got Paul that also states that he was using the scriptures. And so I, I have I have I have trouble seeing the distinction between hmm. like th- them actually like somebody reporting that Jesus was crucified and that being like mm-hmm. a, a historical fact versus mm-hmm. just uh, a, a fabrication. Yeah, uh, like yeah. you know that. 
they, they were fabricating this. So I'm just kind of yeah. wondering what, what can help us discern between those two? Yeah. Well, for one thing, you can say definitely the gospel writers didn't invent it because mm -hmm. Paul was writing 20 years before that, and he, he already has it as a firm tradition. And uh, so, so the gospel writers couldn't have invented it because it was around before them. So, you know, you absolutely know that much. So maybe Paul fabricated it. Part of the problem with that is that there's no evidence to suggest that the gospel writers knew the writings of Paul uh, necessarily. And so uh, they wouldn't have gotten it from him. But maybe an early Christian fabricated it would be your, I think, the line you'd have to take. is Maybe Christians said that the, the Messiah had to be crucified, according to the Old Testament. And so Christians came up with the idea that Jesus was crucified. So that's, a, that's the kind of thing that a historian who's being skeptical with the sources, like historians are, uh, they would, that's the kind of thing they'd have to consider then. Is that, is that a likely explanation for the fact that the crucifixion of Jesus is mentioned not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but in unique sources available to uh, Matthew and Luke and John that were earlier than Matthew, Luke, and John, and, uh, and, uh, and in Paul, and in the book of Acts, and in, in all these independent sources. So they all say it. Uh, it's also in Josephus. And it's, I mean, so you got, you know, there's a lot of sources. And so if you're going to say, well, it didn't happen, then you have to come up with a plausible explanation for like, you know, when, when it got invented and why it spread so far. And so that's not, not impossible. So what you do then is you examine the claim. Okay, maybe somebody, um, somebody made it up in order to fulfill the prophecies about the coming Messiah. Okay, so that would be the explanation. But there's a very, very, very serious problem with that explanation. There was nobody um, in the world at the time who expected a Jewish Messiah to be crucified. In fact, when you find out what Jews thought about the coming Messiah, crucifixion was the opposite of what they thought would happen. Um, there's no passage in the Old Testament that talks about a Messiah being crucified or a Messiah even suffering and dying. Um, and so at the time of Jesus, we have a pretty good record of what Jews thought about the coming Messiah, because we have other, we have Jewish writings from the time, um, you know, after the Old Testament, but in, in the time of Jesus, we have, um, we have books from apoc apocryphal Jewish writings, for example, and we have, we have authors who talk about the Messiah. And so, so we know what they pretty well thought. And they, there was a range of opinion about the Messiah. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, um, we have we have record of various you know views about the Messiah. Some people thought there were going to be two messiahs, uh, and the, so we can look at what they were expecting. And in every case, whatever the differences were, in every case, the Messiah was expected to be a powerful figure who would overthrow the enemies and set up a kingdom, uh, who would bring in God's kingdom on earth. Uh, and sometimes he's portrayed as a political figure, like a military figure, a human military figure. Sometimes he's portrayed as a divine cosmic figure who comes from heaven to wipe out the enemy. There, there are various expectations. But in every one of these expectations, uh, including those found in the Hebrew Bible, there's nothing about a crucified Messiah. So to say that he got invented in order to fulfill Scripture doesn't make sense because Scripture doesn't predict it. Well, so, and, and th I guess this is where I'm kind of in a, a weird position uh, because I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and I do agree that there, there, there were some Jews, um, you know, that were expecting a military messiah to, you know, fulfill this very uh, real um, overcoming of, of the adversaries on earth and everything like that, um, as opposed to like, you know, Satan and demons and all that. But um, but the, but but when I go out and I, I look at other scholars that um, are you know experts uh, all, also experts in this particular area like uh, Daniel uh, Boyeran uh, and Martin Hangel um, and scholars like that uh, they they seem to have it pretty firmly uh, you know and unequivocally stated that there was a pre-Christian suffering and dying Messiah concept in Judaism. Uh, prior to the advent of Christianity. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of at, I, I guess, a, a difficult point here about, you know, which like, like the, there's, and, and there's more scholars than Boyerin and Hengel uh, that assert this, but um, there are, uh, you know, multiple scholars in this particular area that seem to um, argue uh, from the primary texts um, that there was a suffering and dying 
pre-Christian Messiah uh, or, or pre-Christian idea of, of a Messiah. And so I, I guess that's that's kind of where I, I'm, I'm having a hard time with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, well, comparing both of these hypotheses. Yeah, what I suggest you do is you look up the text that they refer to and see if they're talking about a suffering Messiah. I mean, this is what scholars do. You know, scholars disagree on everything, but there are very few scholars. Hang Hangel was a very committed Christian who believed that um, Jesus fulfilled Scripture, and he wanted mm -hmm. he didn't. I mean, he was he was a, he was a committed conservative Christian, and conservative Christians do talk about suffering messiahs. They talk about Isaiah 53, for example, or Psalm 22. When you actually look at those passages, just read them yourself. You don't need to take my word for it. You'll see they're not talking about the Messiah. And so Hangel might say they're talking about the Messiah, but look at them yourself. Look and see if the term Messiah is used in there. Look to see what term is used in there. So it's always possible to take a very thin sliver of scholars um, who might say this, but uh, this is what th that view has never really caught any traction among critical. I mean, I'm talking about 99% of the scholars who, who do this stuff think, yeah, no, not really. Uh, so, but I mean, I, I guess it's, it's still a little difficult for me because I mean, I've, I've found like over 30 scholars uh, in this particular area that, that assert this exact thing that there was a pre Christian suffering. Have you looked at their Messiah. references? Have yeah. you looked them up? Okay, where in Isaiah yes, 53 does it talk about a suffering Messiah? Well, I guess that's the distinction that's being made, is that there's an original intent for Isaiah 52 and 53, which I, I, I agree okay. with the, the scholar. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Well, then, what um, name a Jewish writer from the time of Jesus that interpreted it as a suffering Messiah? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm not the expert in the field. I've just I've I've read what the experts say. Well, you haven't so. been reading the right experts. If you if you if if you just look up their references, mm -hmm. where, for example, does Josephus talk about a suffering Messiah? Where does Philo talk about a suffering Messiah? When do any of the apocrypha talk about a suffering Messiah? Just look them up. What typically happens? What the the biggest case that's sometimes made is that one of the Dead Sea Scrolls may refer to a suffering Messiah. But when mm -hmm. you actually look at the argument, you realize that the term Messiah that they're reconstructing as being suffering is not actually in the text. There's a hole in the manuscript. And it's called okay. providing the term Messiah <laughs> for the hole. <laughs> now, I, like, if you want to read about Messiah, or if you re listeners want to read about the Messiah, and I'll tell you, I mean, just a really good scholar who's not trying to you know, make a big point about this guy's actually a Christian. He, he's a Catholic Christian who, who's a, his name is John Collins, professor of uh, Hebrew Bible and Jewish Apocrypha at Yale. And um, he's written a number of books about Jewish expectations of Messiah, and it's crystal clear. Um, there weren't Jews who were, pre, pre, who, were pre, who were anticipating a suffering Messiah. Okay, well, but I, 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 I get carefully picking you know, what scholars you're listening to and watching out for any bias, but like Daniel Boyer and uh, he's a rabbinical, you know, scholar. Um, he's, he's a premier one uh, out from uh, UC Berkeley. So not like a, you know, a no, Christian he's a, institution. He's, he's a good friend of mine. Okay. Well, I yeah. mean, he, no, I he mean, he's a very fine scholar. Yeah. And he has, this is an idiosyncratic view of his. Okay. That's fine. People have idiosyncratic views. But I mean, he he points. So Daniel Boyron's argument is that the Talmud actually reveals, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, a suffering and dying Messiah yeah, yeah. idea yeah. that reaches all the way back pre in, ah. in a pre-Christian time. Ah, now wait a second. When was the Talmud written? Well, yeah, the Talmud's written late. I, yeah, I understand that. So if we're talking once you once you start talking about the Talmud, you're talking about a book that was written 500 years after Jesus. Now, I don't think you would probably want to take a book today written in the 21st century to decide what somebody meant in the 16th century. Well, no, but uh, I, I believe, uh, isn't it, would you, would you agree that the Talmud can contain uh, teachings in, in the Jewish community that existed prior to the advent of Christianity? Um, I'd say it's very rare for it to happen. And if you want to read about that, the uh, Jacob Neusner, 
who uh, is the, probably the most prolific author of ancient Judaism in modern times. He wrote, God, he wrote hundreds of books, um, showed why you just can't use the Talmud to talk about things in the days of Jesus. And so that's just that's just kind of common knowledge today. And if you if you want to make a case for a particular view, then you've got to make a case because, of course, scholars consider everything. Scholars don't just mm -hmm. throw out things. They they look carefully. They examine them. And uh, so are, if there are passages in the Talmud, for example, that talk about Jesus, which there are, are these historically reliable discussions of Jesus? And how do you decide? I think the big problem, John, is that um, people who um, want to prove their own position latch on to uh, a scholar who says something that's acceptable to them. And it happens all the time. You know, people will quote me for things, and, and that's fine. But it isn't a matter of just saying, well, if one scholar says this, therefore I'm going to believe it. And, you know, some I think too many people believe things that are convenient to their particular points of view. Um, and I think the better thing to do is just to examine things disinterestedly. You know, I mean, I'm not a Christian myself. I have no particular investment in whether Jesus was crucified. I mean, I, you know... I don't think he was raised from the dead. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I, but I think that, it, you know, historically, I, I will say, by the way, that the quote, scholars you are quoting are convinced that Jesus was crucified. So if you're going to say <laughs> that Hangel and Boyarin, you know, give you evidence that he wasn't crucified, well, then why don't they, why isn't that their view? Oh, I, I wasn't trying to suggest that I think that they thought that he wasn't crucified or anything. I, I was just uh, trying to, I, I'm trying to come at this from a very unbiased sort of view. And uh, like I said, I, I've, I've heard the, the side for supporting that he actually but was what, crucified. Well, what Sorry. scholars do you know that say he wasn't crucified? I mean, there are, there are thousands of experts on the New Testament. Um Right. You know, we have PhDs in New Testament who teach New Testament in universities and colleges, and you know a lot of them are Christians. Some are Jews. Um, some at our conference, we're going to have Jewish speakers and Christian speakers, and and uh, you know I know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scholars. I don't I don't know any New Testament scholar who says that Jesus wasn't crucified. So I'm not saying that's evidence. You know, now it's not evidence that they ought to say that, but you know they probably have a pretty good reason for saying it. <laughs> and if if you disagree with it, you know you probably need some pretty good evidence. Right, and I guess I just I have difficulty being able to actually discern between the fabrication and the historical fact uh, because there's such a diverse view, it seems, uh, on this idea of a, of a suffering and dying Messiah. It, Is there a diverse that, view about Jesus being crucified? Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, no, cause I, I was no. just, there's okay. not that big of a diversity about whether there is a pre-Christian suffering Messiah. If there was, then you'd have to ask, what's the evidence that that was made up for Jesus, given the fact that the widespread view in Judaism, um, that we have the only view attested in, in Judaism, uh, you know, that the only explicitly attested view in Judaism are, is that the Messiah was going to be a glorious figure to overthrow the enemy. Um, and so if you want to say that, that, you know, well, there was this view about a crucified and by the way, the suffering Messiah is not a crucified Messiah. When boy, our inner people, they didn't never talk about a crucified Messiah. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that is kind of getting specifically to uh, uh, to an execution method, which is admittedly a different argument. And I also want to state that, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, there could have still been like a Jesus that ended up being crucified. I guess my only contention was this idea that it was unexpected. Um, that's the only contention that I was bringing up here today was uh, well, I just think it's completely the, unexpected. I don't think there's any other way to explain what happens with the disciples. I mean, they, they weren't expecting to be crucified. Well, and the big I, polemic, I guess... you know, the big polemic against Jesus in the early Jewish sources, the polemic against him was he can't be the Messiah because he was crucified. So why are Jews arguing that if they were expecting a crucified Messiah or a suffering Messiah? 
Well, I mean, I, I haven't I haven't looked at those particular uh, things, uh, but I mean, I, I think that the the Jews that probably would have been using that were Jews that were adhering to the military Messiah idea, and not the radical sect that eventually turned into Christians. I think that that would be the big difference there. Well, the the radical sect that turned into Christians wasn't a sect before they were Christians; they were just Jews. Well, I meant sect of Jews. I didn't mean sect of Christians. I'm sorry. No, no, but they, were, they weren't a sect of Jews. They were just Jews. They weren't, you know, it's not like, it's not like Christian denominations today where you get, you know, you get kind of these mainline churches and every now and then you get this group and people say, wow, that's an interesting sect. You know, it, it, these, these were unaffiliated. You know, they weren't like Pharisees or Sadducees or Essenes. They were just Jews. And so um, I think, you know, I just think it's a real problem because to, I mean, I think every every option ought to be entertained as a historian. I think you ought to entertain every option. But in order to go against an overwhelming mountain of evidence to accept a, some other position, it's absolutely fine to do that. I mean, I, I have views that that you know most most scholars disagree with. It's fine, but you've got to have you you need to have solid reasons for thinking so, other than what if? You know, a what if argument isn't a historical argument. A historical argument looks at evidence. And so I guess I would ask, what would be the counter evidence? Um, not, not what it could it have happened. It was like, well, anything could have happened. But what's the evidence that that did happen? Mm -hmm. So that would no, be the I, question I, I would raise. You know, for yeah, somebody that, thinks that Jesus was in the crucifixion was in bed, I'd say, well, okay, what's the evidence of it? Uh, I mean, I guess you just have to point to Paul, right? Uh, Paul is the first one to state that he was crucified. He says that he got it from others, right? Um, first well, I was just meaning. Sorry, so, I was just meaning the first written source that we have about it. Yeah, well. I think the, the followers of Jesus were saying that he got crucified immediately after his death because Paul converted three years later, and Paul was persecuting these Christians precisely for saying that, that the Messiah, mm -hmm. that the crucified man was the Messiah. So it was something that was come up with before Paul converted. Um, that's why he was persecuting people. Uh, and so who, who came up with it and how did, and on what grounds? I mean, especially because, you know, the earliest Christians were by and large illiterate. Um, they weren't reading their Hebrew Bibles, trying to find passages, you know, to to support their idea that the Messiah had to be crucified. They, they couldn't read. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Paul, Paul, I mean, Paul was says that he was looking through the scriptures. So, I mean, I Paul, think Paul I think was he, converted because he was persecuting people before he was converted. So he wasn't right. looking through the scriptures to try and prove that Jesus. That's actually the problem. The reason people are quoting passages like Isaiah 20, 53 and Psalm 22 is because they had to explain how it is the Messiah could get crucified. It didn't make any sense. And Paul especially, he was really hung up on this verse in Deuteronomy that a person who hangs on the tree is cursed. And he couldn't figure out how could the cursed man be the Christ? <laughs> That's just the opposite. And so these are the kinds of struggles people were having is trying to reconcile the facts of history that this guy, this criminal got crucified and now people are calling him the Messiah and that's nuts. And people say, well, actually, you know, it's because, oh, look at this. Isaiah 53 talks about a righteous man who suffers. I bet that's, I bet it was talking about the Messiah. But that interpretation of Isaiah 53 did not exist prior to Christianity. Well, uh, like like I said, I've I've looked at other experts and and they they seem to think that it was a pre Christian idea. But I also think that the whole suffering, like the the shameful suffering, the humiliated Savior, I think that that's uh, you know further explained by like um, Jewish texts like the Wisdom of Solomon. Um, that you know it, it's got Wisdom it's got of Solomon. Some yeah, have you read the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter seventeen? Uh, I haven't read 17. Uh, I think the, the pertinent right. passages for, oh, but, sorry. Look, I mean, you can think anything you want. I mean, you know, it's, it's a free country. It's just a question of whether you want to be doing history or if you want to be, I mean, I don't know you. I don't know you obviously. And I don't know what your personal religious views are. I'm, I think I could guess at this point, but I'm just saying that, you know, if some people do history for convenience, 
You know, they try to find things historically that support the view they already had. And, um, you know, it's not really a good way to do history. It's better to look uh, and try and see what actually happened. And then if it involves belief, then change your belief if you have to. But, you know, I don't think you shouldn't go in trying to find evidence to support a view you have. You should just go in to look at the evidence. Oh, well, I mean, I, I started, uh, you know, this, I guess, journey, uh, if you will, uh, trying to find evidence to support, you know, statements that I can make about Jesus. And I ended up finding a whole bunch of scholarship that seemed to point in a different direction. And so I've kind of been, you know, uh, I, I guess, uh, anal uh, analyzing, uh, you know, taking yeah. all of the information yeah. into account and everything. Oh, you so, got to do that. Absolutely, you got to do that. But it is, yeah. worth, it is worth bearing in mind that all of these scholars you're talking about that are supporting the view that you're now taking are, are ones who, who don't accept your view. And so that's probably significant. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't, as far as the very, the, the specific argument that we were talking about, like here, or the topic, not argument, but the topic that we were talking about here today, um, I guess I was oh, just really focused on that particular topic and not like whether or not the scholar uh, wholly agrees with me um, uh, on anything. Well, the topic I thought was, was Jesus crucified? Well, I mean, I, I, I started down that path and, and, and then, you know, thinking about, well, what evidence do we have about this? And, you mm -hmm. know, we started talking about how, you know, that there, uh, you know, were no uh, Jews in pre-Christian uh, in the pre-Christian time frame that thought of a dying Messiah. And it's like, well, you know, okay. there, there are. So let me just let me just turn the tables okay. in and ask: What evidence do you have that it was made up? What ev what ev what evidence do you have for the other view then? Oh well, I mean, I'm not making the argument that it definitely was made up. Um, I'm just saying that there is evidence out there that Jews were expecting a suffering and dying Messiah. Okay. And well, so, what that, evidence would you have that would make if if you're not sure one way? What evidence do you have that would make you suspect it was made up? What evidence do you have that that it may have been made up? Uh, well, I mean, I, I feel like the factors that play into it are the fact that, you know, Christians were known for creating peshers to reveal information about the Messiah and um, with them expecting or doing these peshers and expecting a suffering and dying Messiah, it could have easily been made up like this. This is a, a story that could have, uh, you know, easily yeah. come so that's to a could, them. That's a could have. That's a could have argument. It could have happened. Right. And, you know, it could have happened that a lot of things could have happened, you know, could have crucified the wrong guy, for example. You know, maybe they crucified right. Simon of Cyrene instead of Jesus. They got him mistaken or, um, you know, so there are lots of could haves. And what historians do is they, you know, they, they come up with their as long a list of could haves as they can. And then they, you know, see which ones have evidence. And so apart mm -hmm. from could have, I, do, I don't. I can't think of what evidence there would be that somebody made it up. I can think of, I know of lots of evidence that they didn't make it up, but I can't, I mean, and I'd be happy for them to have made it up. I don't care. I mean, <laughs> but I just, um, so, you know, I mean, I don't care if Abraham Lincoln really delivered the Gettysburg Address, particularly. I think he did, but, you know, it's not something I'm invested in. So I think, I think the could have approach is important because you have to figure out what options are there. Mm -hmm. You know, is it an option that they crucified Simon of Cyrene? Uh, is it an option that uh, Jesus uh, escaped jail? Is it an option that uh, Jesus was never arrested, but actually escaped and became an old man who grew up in Nazareth? You know, I mean, could have happened. And so once you have the could haves, then you look to see, well, is there anything in the historical record to suggest it one way or the other? Um, and if there's no evidence for one of the could haves, then why would you prefer that to uh, one of the could haves that has all the evidence? Well, I, I guess uh, other than, other than um, uh, I guess what I took away from before when we were discussing this, you said that one of the key factors playing into saying that it actually did happen was that the Jews weren't expecting a suffering and dying Messiah. And so what is, is there other evidence that yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah no, there's lots okay. of other evidence. I mean, that's a corollary because you asked, maybe somebody made it up. And I said, well, it's not the sort of thing they would have made up. That's one of the things, but the, uh, the other, the other issues are things that, uh, even, uh, Paul must have heard about Jesus being crucified within a couple of years of his death because he was, 
he was, I mean, Jesus definitely died. I think, I mean, he died, I assume. I mean, it's what all the records say. You know, there's no, until you get like something like, you know, modern times, Constant Sockets or something, everybody knew Jesus died. And so he died somehow or, or other. Um, and so uh, Paul appeared to think that he got crucified within a couple of years of it. It's in every single reference to Jesus' death that we have that he was crucified. It fits perfectly well with what we know about Judea. Uh, in the in the late 20s, early 30s of the Common Era. If it's imperfectly well with what we know about uh, what was happening at Passover feasts and what we know about Pontius Pilate, and it's not disconsonant with, consonant with anything, and it's attested in independent sources all over the map. And so uh, there's all sorts of evidence for it. And um, there, you know, there are ways to imagine maybe something else happened, but I don't know of any evidence that anything else happened. Uh, well, I mean, I I do have some contention around the independent sources, but I I'm, I know that that you know you're you're very busy, and I've already kept you way longer <laughs> right. than I initially intended. Um, uh, so I I don't want to keep you too much longer. But um, do you mind reminding everybody about the conference that's going on, and if if they want to hear like more great information from you? Yeah. Well. Uh, so yeah. And so. Um, I don't mind mentioning that at all <laughs> because, you know, the, this is this is a conference that um, I've never heard of anything like this conference, frankly, um, where you have top level scholars uh, talking about areas of their expertise about, you know, the New Testament Gospels and Jesus um, to non scholars. And that, you know, you get 10 of these people and they're, they're all doing different things. They're all really interesting with Q&A, live Q&A after each one. And so um, I highly recommend it. It's an interesting group of people that we've assembled. Some, um, some are, like me, are agnostic or atheist. Some are Christian. Some are Jews. Some are archaeologists. Some are textual experts. Some are historians. I mean, it's like it's a range of things who are all top-level experts. So for people who are interested in um, anything related to the Gospels, this would be the thing. It's on September 23rd, 24th, and uh, they can just go to my website, Bart, uh, bartgerman.com, and get the information. Yeah, and I will have a link down below where y'all can go and get tickets or just check out the conference if you want to, seeing who's speaking there and what topics are available. So um, if y'all will, hit up those links down below. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oh. Ehrman, for, for coming on today. Sorry, Bart. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much for coming on. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, like, it, this is great. It's very I, I, lo I love getting in heated discussions. <laughs> There's a few things yeah. I like better. <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, I, I just suggest everybody just kind of keeps at it and, you know, has an open mind about just, you know, every option then, you know, and ask themselves, does evidence matter or not? And if it matters, then where does the evidence go? That's that's all. I mean, as a historian, that's really what I, I try to do. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that sentiment. So thank you again, Bart, for okay. uh, joining me today. And I My guess pleasure. we will see. Yeah, I, we will see you heathens later. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens. <laughs>